I'm Tamara Wilcox, and I'm here at the Siegel Museum um, researching the piano builder Nanette Stein Stryker. And I'm here with the, with the curator and expert, Tom Strange. Thank you. Good to meet with you. So I understand you have a number of questions, and, and I'm going to let you fire away, and then I will answer to the best of my ability. Thank you so much. Um, well, from what I understand, this piano um, would have been made in the factory of Nanette Stein's father, where she worked uh, from early on. If you could tell us a little bit about that um, right. and her so, involvement in this particular instrument. So this piano was made in 1784. And uh, when we think of, uh, of a factory today, we think of something that's sort of apart from the, the housing and this, you know, a fairly large building and such. Uh, imagine more of a shop where the living quarters might be uh, above uh, the area where they're doing the, the actual work. There may be a showroom down on the first floor. Uh, so you would have a showroom, perhaps living quarters, and then uh, you know, maybe above that is the actual shop itself, and things would be brought up and down uh, at that shop. So, so uh, the, you know, one of the interesting points about this piano, because it's it's made in 1784, it's a little later than some of the steins in, in museums that we see around the world. And uh, his daughter, Anna Marie, which, uh, which later became, you know, they, they called her Nanette, uh, uh, she uh, was born in 1769. Uh, she was a precocious child. By the time she was seven years old, she had already won a, a little uh, contest for singing and uh, was becoming an expert keyboard player. Uh, Mozart encountered her in, uh, 18, in, in 1777. And uh, wrote his father back, said uh, that he thought that, that she was an extremely good uh, pianist, could be great uh, if she can only get rid of some uh, uh, mannerisms that she had uh, acquired. Uh, so, of course, you know, being Mozart, he's never going to you know, give everybody a, a, a complete pass. The other thing that happens about this time is that she has taken an interest in her father's work in the shop, and she's entered the shop. And to all accounts, uh, she entered the shop with the idea of becoming essentially an apprentice. Apprenticeship programs at the time would have lasted for about seven years. So uh, Nanette's uh, now 15 years old in 1784. And my suspicion, and the suspicion of several other people, is that she was already playing a fairly large role in the shop by then. She would have learned uh, all the basics and some of the finer points of making pianos. And so as we look at this one, uh, we would have to, to wonder how much of this is the father and how much is the daughter. Indeed. And um, could you tell us about um, some of the technological advancements that um, her father had achieved by this time? Well, his achievement, uh, the what we now know of as the Viennese action, uh, was a, a very significant uh, achievement indeed. Uh, up to this time, uh, pianos had largely followed uh, some of the trends laid down by Cristofori. So Bartolomeo Cristofori uh, comes out with the very first piano uh, on or about the year 1700. Uh, it's fairly complicated to make the action, and it's a fairly complicated construction for the instrument such that it's expensive and it's uh, a bit of a plaything for princes and kings during at least the first half of the 18th century. Uh, Silverman uh, picks up the idea, uh, his initial uh, uh, entry into it is, uh, is reasonable. Now he shows it to uh, Johann Sebastian Bach. Bach said that, that's, that's sort of intriguing but uh, the, the tone quality is uneven, and uh, it's a little bit too heavy. I couldn't play rapid passages, so I'd probably pass on it. Uh, uh, Silverman was crushed by this uh, evaluation, but he goes back into the shop. We know that by 1748, uh, he's shown it to Bach again, and Bach says, ah, now you have something. Will you help me sell these? Yes, I will help you sell these. And they actually sold one, and then Bach dies. And so, you know, Silverman's chief 
person that would have you know, gotten him new clients has passed away. The Silverman tradition is out there. Uh, some of the other traditions that are creeping up at this time, uh, Spaeth and Schmoll have come up with uh, a tangent piano uh, action, which is sort of an abbreviated version of the Christoph reaction, but rather than trying to throw up yet another arm, it simply throws up a little uh, stick at the strings, sometimes with a, a strip of leather on the top, sometimes just bare wood against the strings. And Mozart has a tangent piano when he visits uh, Stein's shop in 1777. So the, the, uh, the, the, the and Small uh, uh, concept is out there. Uh, the English haven't really picked up anything in particular by 1766, uh, Zumpy has come out with his little uh, English single action for a square piano. And we also know that uh, some of the earlier uh, uh, makers who were in London are experimenting with designs for the piano. Uh, ultimately, America's backers would show up with what we now know of as the English grand action. All of these are trying to do what? Well, there, there, there were three problems with the piano when it's first introduced. It's, it's fairly expensive to make one. It costs twice what it costs to make a harpsichord to build one of these pianos. There's no music written for it, and everybody that's trained as a musician is trained to play something else, a harpsichord, a clavichord, the organ in particular. So if you're a musician, and I, and I say, well, I have a very expensive instrument here, would you like to buy it? You say, I can Never hope to afford it. I'm not trained to play it, and there's no music written for you. Thank you. <laughs> so the builders need to solve at least one of those problems to get any kind of adoption going. Dynamics are becoming very important in the music, and as the 18th century progresses, there's more and more demand for dynamics within even the keyboard instruments. Harpsichords can do some dynamics, but they struggle to have the kind of dynamic control that a pianoforte can have. And so when Stein and Augsburg first begins to, uh, to play with this idea of the piano in the early 1770s, uh, he, at first, you know, what should it be? Well, maybe it should be coupled with a harpsichord. And so he builds this very large vis-a-vis -vis, uh, instrument with a piano on one side and a harpsichord on the other, joined together, almost like a long rectangle. And, you know, that's a concept. We haven't quite got out of the, the idea that you know, the harpsichord could really be supplanted. So he continues to work on things. By 1777, uh, he's certainly got uh, pianos in the shop for people to come look at. The idea of the piano is beginning to percolate in people's mind. And while Augsburg was a center of musical development as well at this time, Vienna was rising as kind of the musical capital. And so in Vienna, uh, people are casting about for what to do, what to do. And the idea of this particular action is what caught everybody's imagination. It works so well. It's so simple and yet so effective. And so the Viennese picked this idea up very quickly. And while Stein is still building, folks all over Vienna are starting to build this action in the late 1770s and certainly all through the, the 80s, the 90s. In fact, the Viennese action would go until the end of the 19th century. Next question. Um, <clears throat> could you tell us um, some about uh, more details about this instrument? For example, what types of woods have been used? So in this instrument, uh, uh, as with most Viennese pianos, the, uh, the underlayment under the, the out exterior veneer uh, is going to be a, a very strong surface wood. This one is an oak uh, with, with some pine surface wood uh, you know, added in. Uh, it uses the A-frame construction, which if you have done any kind of uh, research on the Viennese piano, you know that this is one of the most uh, engineering efficient ways of of creating a very strong structure that can resist the, the tension of the strings. This one has roughly 5,000 pounds of tension on it. And imagine, you, you know, 5,000 pounds, what is that? Well, that's roughly the weight of a Honda CRV with a couple of people in it. That's been hanging off the side of this piano since 1784. 
and the piano is straight and true. So that's a that's a lot for you know, over you know two hundred and forty years. And how about the keys? What are the keys made out of? Well, we're going to take a look at that with the camera in just a bit, but you'll notice that it's like so many of the Viennese and other German, even French keyboards of the 18th century, the latter part of the 18th century, is what we call the reverse keyboard. So we have on the accidentals, we have the, the, the key tops made of ebony. Uh, on the, on the, the, for the naturals, on the accidentals, uh, we use a stained fruit wood, and then on the top, uh, bone, or perhaps if you wanted to have a really nice keyboard, uh, you would indulge in a little bit of ivory. Uh, Germany doesn't really have a, a trade uh, with Africa at this time. Af uh, uh, Austria doesn't either. Uh, the French don't. And so ivory would have had to have come in through one of the countries that has a trade, such as the Dutch countries or uh, the, the UK. And then it would be marked up. And so it would be rather expensive for these people to use. Remember, one of the things that they're trying to work on is how do you make this thing cheap enough that people can afford it? Mm -hmm. And so Ebony came in through the India trade. That trade had been established effectively with Marco Polo. And so uh, the India trade is strong uh, you know, throughout all of Europe. No problem getting Ebony. And uh, the hammers, are they covered with leather? So these hammers are covered with leather. Most of the, uh, the pianos with the Viennese action, uh, there would be at least a layer of leather on there. Uh, these have the single layer of leather uh, uh, over a wooden head. Uh, with time, uh, an additional layer of leather will, will begin to appear. And then finally, we'll start having a little thin core of wood and building up the rest of it with leather. Why is this? Well, uh, the material that you use to cover the hammer is going to do an awful lot in shaping the tone of the piano. So if you're looking for something that's fairly uh, brittle and strident, not unlike a harpsichord, then you might even throw up a bare piece of wood at the strings, which will give the, the greatest clash. But uh, a single coating of leather will give you a nice strike, uh, but with a very, very fast rebound. So the leather that they're going to use uh, is a special kind of tanned leather. Uh, it, it doesn't have hardly any stretch at all, but it's very resilient. And it's, it, if it's just right, it's sort of like it's a baby butt soft <laughs> sort of leather. So it's just like, like the, 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 a soft cheek to touch, and yet firm in the way it works. So the hammer is going to come up and it's going to contact the string and it's going to do this for about two to three thousandths of a second and then it's going to fall back away and now the string will start to vibrate. That's critical. If I used bare wood, the impact is going to last, last less than mm -hmm. a thousandth of a second and that means a lot of harmonics are going to get created and that's the clashy sound that you hear when you kind of crash something into a string. With a single layer of leather, we're getting uh, a happy compromise between the, the clash and yet taking away some of those unpleasant harmonics. As I begin to build leather on there, it's more and more of that fundamental and less and less of the kind of harmonics that we think of as being sort of noise in the music. And so the sonority and the singing power of the piano improves as uh, the strings get thicker and the hammers get more padded. We say improves, but it also takes away. What does it take away? It takes away some of the clarity and, and, and the aspirational quality of the sound so that when you hear two notes played close together, uh, on, a, on a piano like this, uh, they might each sing separately. If you do this on a, on a grand piano, a, a Steinway, for instance, uh, they're, they're going to sound more overlapped. In fact, sometimes you just write the little uh, you know, uh, couplet to say we're going to couple these uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, two notes together. And they've actually changed manuscripts for, of all places, you know, the Urtex edition mm -hmm. to make it sound good on a modern piano. 
And then when you go backwards to here, you find, ah, but there is room for these separate notes to be heard and, ex and experienced. And uh, part of the reason why we're so eager to have people come and experience the sound of the truly early piano. Absolutely. Um, what's, what types of materials are the strings made out of, or would they have been at the time? So the strings are made of what they would have called best Berlin wire. Uh, wire drawing had been known, of course, since the Middle Ages, if you think of chain mail. Uh, you know, what is chain mail but little pieces of wire, you know, coupled together. In the old days, you would have sat on a, uh, a bench with a, a long rope and some tongs. And you've got a, a, an ingot that you're going to draw through, and you, know, you have a first orifice. And I swing forward, and I grab it, and I push back and pull, and mm -hmm. then I push back and pull. With the advent of water power, I can now run a wheel and do this on a more continuous basis. And then by the time this piano was made, wire drawing had become something of an art. So. Mm -hmm. We are using a type of uh, steel that is uh, what we call high phosphorus steel. Um, uh, the the uh, antique term for it is wrought iron. Okay. When we think of wrought iron today, we think, well, that's just something that, that somebody has welded up for a gate. But wrought iron was actually a high phosphorus steel that resists rust quite a lot. Uh, and so it works well outdoors and it worked well for music wire because it was stronger than any other type of steel that they had. They haven't yet learned uh, how to put carbon in the steel and make it work out. If you put carbon into high phosphorus steel, it becomes exceptionally brittle and it can't be drawn. So it's almost no good anymore. So that doesn't work. Well, what does work? So the, 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 the phosphor steel uh, works pretty well. And it makes uh, the, the sound of the piano is very much determined also by the metallurgy that we've used. So a curious little point, uh, a, a wire always sounds its very best right before it breaks. So <laughs> the maximum tension. Now, as a piano tuner, I don't want a piano that's been scaled to a point where you know, even a, a slight inflection above, and I'm going to break a string every time. So they always would give it a little bit of safety margin, but they're trying to bring that tension up to a very high point, mm -hmm. not far away from the breaking point. So if you do that with phosphorus steel, you're going to get a certain scale that, that naturally comes out of that, where the sound is the best and the response is the best, and, and the smaller hammers are going to work with it. Uh, the strings are still fairly small on this, but they are twice the diameter, at least, over what would have been on a harpsichord with the same kind of uh, uh, disposition, same kind of octave range. So they've learned that they needed to use heavier wire, and yet they don't want to use too heavy a wire. And so the entire thing is built around, well, how much tension is that, well, what can I do with wood, and so on and so forth. As the 18th century marches into the 19th, uh, people are continuing to work on things like metallurgy. And one of the things that happens is from the Far East, we learn that if we uh, uh, scour and sponge the phosphorus out and then add carbon, then the metallurgy changes dramatically and the strings can become far stronger. So modern music wire has a strength perhaps four times higher than anything on this piano. What does that mean? That means if I take modern music wire, same diameter that I have here, and I put it on this piano, I am so far away from the breaking point, what will we expect from that wire? Well, it's a kind of a flabby, oh, so, so kind of sound. If I take the tension up, you know, well, what, what if we run it at, at A500, Tom? Wonderful. I begin to bring the tension up and the piano collapses because what? It was designed for a, a particular tension. Won't we'll actually collapse the, the piano, the, the uh, uh, hitch pin rail will pull away from the side and, and, and will be done that way. But it won't work. That's the end result, it won't work. So if we were to take our Steinway and string it up with the old wire, that won't work. 
Now it's big hammers against a string that's at way too low a tension, and then the whole thing sounds terrible. So just think about it. The science that went into this is what created the instrument that you got. And a lot of uh, people talk about it as an evolution. A lot of texts talk about it as an evolution. And I think it's better to think of it more as, as an artistic choice and expressional change from the smaller sound with the crisper response to a bigger sound that can fill a, a music hall with a lot more sonority and singing power at the expense of clarity. And these instruments are single strung, right? Well, so uh, we're, we're double strung uh, through, through three quarters of this, and then the last octave and a half are triple strung. Uh, his not crossing. Oh, 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 yes. Yeah. So yes, they are in fact all straight strung. The, uh, the uh, uh, you know, crossed over look for a piano uh, happens uh, you know, on or about uh, the year 1840 uh, with some square pianos in America. And uh, when Steinway first introduces their grand piano, they are straight strung as well, but they quickly moved over to the overstrung uh, design. But then how many strings per note? Uh, right. So uh, in the earliest days of Stein and his contemporaries, they used two strings for each note. Okay. Stein quickly learned that in order to get a treble that balances nicely with everything else, three strings might be good. A few makers, such as Graf, experimented with four strings per note. Beethoven encouraged them on, you know, more and more strings. But it's a curious little thing. Uh, if, if you have one string, you'll get a sound. If you have two strings, you don't get twice the volume. You'll get a, a, a logarithmic fraction because our ears don't hear that way. When you have three strings, it doesn't even add as much uh, again. And by the time you get to four strings, all you've done is completely irritate the piano tuner. <laughs> because the idea of getting four unisons at the same time is just uh, monstrous. And we won't do it. <laughs> um, could you talk about the me levers? <laughs> yes. So uh, this piano was equipped with, with me levers and all the uh, the German pianos and Austrian pianos that, that had, uh, you know, any kind of uh, damper re response would have had the same thing. Square pianos uh, would usually have hand stops on the side and you would set those as you go. Uh, late in the 18th century, pedals were introduced. Uh, if you find a, a, a piano from 18 or 1780 and it's got a pedal on it and it's a square piano, there's a high probability that pedal was added later. Okay. Uh, but uh, uh, this piano does not have pedals. Uh, it is said that at the time uh, that pedals were not really socially acceptable. Mm -hmm. If you went out on the street, uh, you would find the knife grinders out on the street and they're you know, pushing the pedal and making mm -hmm. the wheel go around and earning a pittance, you know, sharpening their knives. So the, the wits and the wags uh, remark that I've never put my foot to a pedal that I didn't feel like a knife grinder in the street. And so pedals, sort of socially unacceptable uh, to, to the gentry class. And for that reason, uh, we think, you know, the knee lever, far more discreet, functions beautifully and takes care of the problem. In London, they weren't so squeamish. And so when Backers brings out his grand piano, why there's a pedal on each leg, one to control the dampers and the other to shift the keyboard over. And grand pianos uh, from Stoddard and then Broadwood would copy this exact thing. Ultimately, the pedals winding up on a pedal lyre in the middle of the piano. And that's what we have today. For the Austrians and the, uh, the, the Germans who were making pianos, uh, they would go with the knee lever until roughly the year 1800 to 1805. Somewhere in there, uh, the idea of having additional gugaws on the piano Turkish music in particular, a drum uh, that you could beat while you were playing, a bell that you could ring, a little strip of paper that would come down on the bass strings and buzz called the bassoon stop, a moderator that would come in and put a strip of cloth between hammer and string so that you got a very, very, uh, you know, four pianissimo kind of effect. 
Uh, those were all things that, uh, that they thought, thought very highly of, even a bus stop that would come down and, or a harp stop, I guess it's called, and, and, and make the piano sound more harp-like. And for that, you needed additional pedals. So pedals began to enter the, the German and Viennese pianos in a real meaningful way, not just one, two, three, but four, five, as much as seven pedals on an instrument to do all of these various things. It's a blizzard of pedals down here. So they, they, uh, they, they went from nothing to everything. Wow. And um, what about the ornamentation on this particular instrument? Well, this one is a little bit interesting because it is in fact highly ornamented on the side mm -hmm. and, and the top. And we suspect that this was added later after it left the, the Stein shop. Uh, Stein uh, was making fairly plain looking pianos and he was a somewhat plainish sort of guy. And the, I don't think that, that uh, there are, aren't any other uh, uh, Stein pianos that are decorated in any way like this. I suspect that this was something that was done by someone who had had some means, uh, perhaps in 1810, 1815, the, the decoration style fits what was being put on pianos about that time. So remember, you know, by then, this piano is already, you know, 30 to 40 years old. And, uh, you know, they're, they're kind of juicing it up a little bit, maybe even to make a sale. But I would suspect it was to uh, fit into a wealthy person's home who wanted a piano much like this. Mm -hmm. So we have five octaves. Uh, we're gonna go from the low FF to the F3. So we're going, gonna go from F to F. Uh, everything that Mozart wrote is gonna fit very nicely in five octaves. Uh, most all music until at least 1791 uh, is gonna stay within the five octaves. Uh, after 1791, uh, Broadwood begins to work at the insistence of uh, actually several musicians toward uh, adding a half octave in the, in the treble, uh, taking it up to that uh, next C. Uh, the five and a half octave piano would be kind of the standard by 1800. Mm -hmm. And then by 1815, uh, uh, six octaves, where we've either gone up to the next F or sometimes we go down to the lower C uh, would be employed. And so six octaves would actually uh, continue nicely along until the 1830s when six and a third, six and a half, finally seven, and up till today's seven and a third octave, on or about you know, the, the uh, 1840s. And is that um, silk decorating the music stand? So yes, so the music stand has the original silk in place. Mm -hmm. uh, the, there's been a few pokes in it, uh, as you might expect, but uh, I'm, I'm quite proud of the fact that the, you know, the, this one has it's, mm -hmm. it's cloth in place. Uh, there may have at one point been a little something that, that covered the tuning pins, mm -hmm. uh, but that was mostly for later Viennese pianos where they would actually have a separate uh, insert piece that would cover up the tuning pins so you didn't have to look at those. Mm -hmm. I think that, I think that uh, those are all the questions I had for you today. Did we cover it? Very yeah. good. <laughs> thank you so much. All right, well, thank you, Tamara. <laughs> And I'll just say, if you, if you want to know more, uh, come see us at Sigil, uh, and or you can write or telephone. And uh, if, if you have a question, if we don't have the answer, we'll point you to the right people.